So you cast your 500th Demonic Tutor and you thought to yourself, man, there's got to be a different version out there, something that I've never seen before. And I'm here to tell you that, no, there's not. That is probably the best tutor in the game. But I do have some janky black cards that we're going to go over today that I think are really fun. Okay, janky is maybe not completely how I would view these. Some of them are actually extremely strong. This video is sort of a continuation of the series where I go over cards that are less commonly played that maybe you should consider playing. Some of these are complete bombs and I'm really excited to go over them with you today. And we have 30 different cards to go over today. It's a lot. And I would say over half of these I have personal experience with and I have a few stories to go along with them. So grab your coffee or it, it might be a long video. So maybe just go ahead and throw me in your ears and then we can uh, get through these cards together. So let's do it. So up first on the list is Bubbling Muck. So for one black, it's a sorcery and it gets you until end of turn, whenever a player taps a swamp for mana, it produces an additional black. This is basically the black version of High Tide. You know, sorcery speed is a little bit of a bummer, but it's still really good in a mono black list. And one of my friends uses this in one of his decks and basically says that it is one of the best cards by far. If you run this in mono black or a deck that typically requires like heavy black requirements, like a lot of black pips, that sort of thing, this card goes really hard. And he basically said it's an auto include for him whenever he makes a mono black deck. And I think that that really speaks volumes. Really, any commander that has a lot of black pips in it can genuinely benefit from this. And if you're in Golgari colors, you can also abuse infinite mana loops with Magus of the Candle Opera and Staff of Domination. I mean, of course, if you've played commander for any amount of time, you know, staff goes infinite with basically everything, but I thought I would still point out this interaction. Some commanders where this can really be useful is chainer, getting you the extra black that you need to do your reanimation loops with chainer. And of course, the stronger the black commander like Villas or Crick just make this card ridiculous. It's just insane. But they make pretty much any black card ridiculous and insane anyway. I feel like that sort of sums up this card. It makes good decks even better if it's mono black and it makes decks that maybe aren't quite as good perform a little bit better as a result of the mana acceleration that this offers you at a later stage in the game. Up next is a personal favorite of mine and that is Clack Bridge Troll. So for five mana, three black black, you get an 8-8 eight, eight troll with trample and haste. And then whenever it enters the battlefield, target opponent creates three zero one one white goat creature tokens. At the beginning of combat on your turn, any opponent may sack a creature. If that player does, you tap the troll and then you gain three life and also draw a card. So like I said, this is a personal favorite. I've used this in my Scorpion God deck and you just get insane value because you wanna use this card in decks that can take advantage of your opponents having the little creatures like the Scorpion God, for instance. It's also pretty insane with things like Toxrill or Massacre Girl as your commander, being able to get a ton of value off of killing those little goats. And I find that this card is just generally really good in a lot of black decks. It's five mana for a hasty 8-8 eight eight with Trample. It's pretty sweet. And yeah, it can be tapped down, but that's a relatively low downside when it draws you a card, it gains you life. And typically also I find that if you're at a table with a little bit more of like political flexibility, you can give the goat to somebody that will not be tapping the troll down, meaning that you can get through to damage like the Troublesome Planeswalker, for instance, then the table will thank you for it. Up next is Urborg Justice. So for two black, it's black, black. You get an instant and it reads, target opponent sacrifices a creature for each creature put into your graveyard from the battlefield this turn. I had to read the, uh, the Oracle text there on that card. This is a great aristocrats piece that's a bit off the beaten path. Anything with excessive token generation and ways to sacrifice them are going to love this card. That sort of acts as like a single-sided board wipe most of the time. And two black really isn't that bad. You can even play this in Orzov or even like a tricolor deck, and I think you're just fine to get away with it. It gets around the selective removal, so things like Hexproof or Ward, which are becoming more and more of issues lately. And I think that this card in general will probably have a place moving forward, especially in Aristocrats lists. Up next is an X spell. So the CMC is two, black, black, and then X for an instant. 
cast this only during combat on an opponent's turn and then return X target creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Sacrifice those creatures at the beginning of the next end step. It's Wake the Dead, by the way. So this is really good. It has Enter the Battlefield and Leave the Battlefield trigger stapled onto it for every single one mana that you pump into this. It's a really cool combat trick that I don't think a lot of people will see coming. I've cast it a couple times and it basically wipes people's board. And if again, if you play this with creatures that care about entering the battlefield or have powerful effects like a Razaketh, for instance, where you can immediately take advantage of the tutoring ability, it works really, really great. This card is also crazy good in Sir Conrad or Radadrabic, and even the new Rakdos the Muscle, it works really well in. Conrad loves to see things leaving and entering, and this does both. It does not exile after they come back, which I feel like a lot of these sort of instant speed ones do. And it also doubles the damage from Conrad as a result. Radadrabic will also make a ton of extra copies of the things once they leave the battlefield again. And Rakdos the Muscle will allow you to exile a ton of cards off of a library for a very low input cost. It's also extra good in the Rakdos list because the clause to cast those cards is until your next end step. So at instant speed, you can do this on somebody else's turn, and then you'll have your full turn to take advantage of that next time. Coming in at number five is Demir Machinations for three mana, two and a black. You get a sorcerer. It's pretty lackluster on this, but we really have it here for another purpose. It has the transmute cost on it, but also look at the top three cards of target opponent's library, remove any number of those cards from the game, so exile them, and put the rest back in any order. You can also transmute for three black black, and transmuting, for those of you that don't know, you discard this card out of your hand and then search your library with the same converted mana cost as this card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and shuffle. And that will basically nets you a three uh, CMC card, so something for three mana. And now this is really in here just for the transmute cost. Um, this is the only transmute spell currently in a mono black format that fetches you a three mana card. And that's again, specifically for black only. It's an accessory tutor, it's very budget. It's like a buck or less. And worst case scenario, this thing is basically just a filter for the top of your deck because it specifies player. It does not have to be an opponent. And yes, there are better tutors. You're not going to top a demonic tutor or a vampiric tutor with this card, but these are also the best already unquestionably for well-established reasons. I'm in no way arguing that this card is better than those but just play those other tutors if you want raw power play this card if you want to impress other people at the table the average vampiric tutor definitely makes you a little bit salty at the table it's sort of like the oh come on it's going to be one of those games again but the average demir machinations machinations how do you pronounce it on the other hand genuinely does not cause that same level of saltiness and just to name a few things, it can get you Buried Alive, Dismember, Toxic Deluge, Ash Nods or Phyrexian Altar, etc. And those are just sort of like the easy, low-hanging fruit cards that I can immediately think of. Once you go outside of this arena, there are so many crazy finishers, combo pieces, synergy cards that are three mana that this card can get. So I think I would, I would honestly highly recommend it because this card can be a tutor when you need it to get something powerful or it could just be filter so it's never like truly dead in hand so up next is a card that i've actually tried a little bit i've had some mixed success with it but i still think it's worth mentioning it's six mana for choice of damnations it's an arcane sorcery that's how you know it's old target opponent chooses a number so you somebody other than you chooses a number you may have that player lose that much life if you do not have them lose that life, that player then sacrifices all but that many permanents. So for example, maybe I'm playing against the token player, right? Somebody has a Kadira caller of the small list and I cast this on that player. So they are going to choose a number effectively. Let's say they choose 10. So at that point, I get to choose as this is resolving whether or not they are going to lose 10 life or sacrifice all but 10 permanents. And that means lands too. So I've had mixed success with this because depending on the stage of the game that you hit people with this card, it can be completely backbreaking because if people only bid a few life, you can say, ah, uh, uh, sacrifice everything, right? Because they wanna keep their few pieces on board that they really need, or maybe they just don't have the life to pay it, putting them in an impossible position, essentially. This card, best case scenario, 
just crushes the game and there's no way to get out from underneath it. Worst case scenario, you play it a little bit too early and people are just willing just to lose a lot of life. It's it's hit or miss for me. I think that you just have to try it. If it fits your pod, I think that it's a great card to include because people will never expect this and everybody reads it like 10 times because they can't believe the effect. So it's fun for that reason at least. Up next is a card that I have used multiple different times with really good effect. It is Bitter Ordeal. So for two and a black, so three mana, you get a sorcery. Search target player's library for a card and exile it. Then that player shuffles their library. And then it has Gravestorm, which is printed on like almost nothing else. When you play this spell, copy it for each permanent put into a graveyard this turn. You may choose new targets for the copies. This card is backbreaking, especially if you are in like a mill list for yourself. I actually put this, I had this in my, uh, oh, what was it called? The Demir Horror Commander. Oh man, I can't think of it. I'll put it up on screen, but it cares about things being in exile essentially and bitter ordeal synergizes with that. And when I built my list, I built it in more of a horror tribal list and also had some like mill components in there primarily. So milling myself and then casting a bitter ordeal going like, okay, I'm going to extract like five of your key cards out of your deck, you know, say goodbye to your underworld breach, lion's eye, diamond, Savine's reclamation, right? It basically is a tutor assassin. It just gets rid of all of the key cards out of your opponent's decks that they need to sort of cheat the win out per se. Or you can also choose new targets for this and sort of selectively remove other people's best cards in their deck, making it a more even playing field for yourself. It's been a really good card. And honestly, like even when I remove people's like win con, so to speak, People haven't been like as salty as I would expect them to be in a situation like that. For some reason, I think because this card is like so sort of niche and people don't see it all the time, people generally are relatively unaffected when it's cast. Oh, and one more thing before we move on. Tokens actually do count toward the Gravestorm. So I actually did ask a judge about this for this card specifically. And because Gravestorm, the ability doesn't specify a permanent card being put into the graveyard, it does actually register when a token goes to the graveyard. So that's something to consider too. Maybe an aristocrat's build, who knows? All right, the next one is, the next one is jank. I, I'm just gonna be honest. It's deathmatch, three and a black for an enchantment. Whenever a creature comes into play, that creature's controller may have target creature of his or her choice get negative three, negative three until end of turn. Man. This results in some stupid board states, let me tell you that, because especially for people that are in a position to take advantage of it, it's sort of like a quasi board wipe for the other person or the other players at the table. I've also seen people abuse this in infinite combo ways where people will get to make their things and then immediately sack them with this ability or sack key pieces on their board as a result of this card. It does a lot of really weird things. So you can use this to pit your enemies against themselves. You can sort of politic and you know, maybe take a slower stance to the game. We're going to go over some of those cards later, but you can also use this in a more aggressive way or in more of like a, you know, self-sacrifice aristocrat style of build if you wanted it. It works in multiple different avenues. Endric Sar Master Breeder is actually a really great option for this because if this is on the battlefield and then you play out Edric Sar and then you play something else and make a bunch of thralls, it generally tends to wipe the board pretty quickly. So this card can be really great for you or it can backfire in an extreme fashion which is sort of the point of today's video i'm not trying to amp up or juice up your decks to crazy levels we're talking about really niche and fun includes that other people typically don't see admittedly this next one is a little bit more common and that's sudden spoiling so it's one black black so three mana for an instant but it has split second which is interesting so split second for those of you that don't know as long as this spell is on the stack players cannot cast spells or activate abilities that are not mana abilities. And then the uh, text on this card reads, until end of turn, creatures target player controls, lose all abilities and have base power toughness zero two. So this card is good for who a number of reasons. So imagine you are going up against somebody who's about to have a really powerful turn and it's because maybe they have a strong commander on the battlefield or have some other strong pieces on the board you can cast this in their upkeep 
So they're forced to play at instant speed and either use their commander or whatever abilities it is right there on the stack for everyone else to be able to police and control better at the table. Or if they don't have that option, it basically removes their turn altogether because you've basically fogged their, or not fog, that's not the right word. You've sort of transmuted their board. That way they can't actively use those target creatures. That's one way to use it. Another way to use this is it's actually just causing those creatures to have a new power toughness. So if there is damage already marked on those creatures, let's say you've already gone to combat or somebody else has, and then you cast this post-combat with damage more than two marked on them, it just kills all the creatures, which is also really good. It, I use this also in my Scorpion God deck and having neg one counters on things, then just changing their power toughness to zero two is absolutely backbreaking for whoever you choose. It's really good. So this card in general has performed really well. And the fact that it has split second on it is just another bonus. Like once you get to add to the stack, nobody else genuinely gets to add to it. So I'd recommend it, especially if you are maybe in more of like a combat trick or board controlling style, you know, type of deck, or maybe you're just looking for sort of like a different unique way to sort of time walk your opponents. It's, it's a genuinely versatile card, and I think that you'll find it's very, um, it's never dead in your hand is what I'm trying to say. Up next is Soul Devi Adnate, which some of you from 1997 probably know this card, but me on the other hand, I did not. It is two mana, one in black for a cleric spell. You tap this, it's a one, two, by the way. You tap this, sack another black or artifact creature, has to be a creature, to add an amount of black equal to that creature's casting cost, mana value, to your mana pool. Play this ability as an interrupt, meaning you can do it at instant speed. So this card is just really good in like reanimator decks or big mana decks that have black in it. I've seen it crop up at many of my tables now over the past couple of years. And in general, it's one of those cards that if you know, you sort of know. Like one of my friends, I remember sitting down with them playing against this card. And when this card hit the table, they went, oh shit. Like we got to get that off the table now. Because if we let them get to the stage where they can start abusing that card, it's going to be disgusting for us. We just can't get over it basically. And, you know, in the moment, being little inexperienced me, I didn't really understand like the, the uh, severity of letting this card go until they started tapping this and then untapping it, generating like eight to 10 mana at a time, especially when there were ways to like cost reduce the creatures or cheat them back out onto the board. This card is disgusting and reanimator for that reason, because you can generate all that extra black mana off your creatures. You get additional enter the battlefield, leave the battlefield triggers, and then it just fuels itself. It's so good. So don't sleep on Soul Devi Adne. And if you don't include this or haven't included it in your decks, especially those that rely on sacking your own things, maybe give it a look. The next card is actually one that I have rarely seen played, maybe just a couple times in my entire like MTG career, and that is Filth. So this is, for those of you that maybe know already, similar to the Wonders and Angers of the world. They're the incarnations that once they're in the graveyard do something. And this one is a four mana 2-2 two -two for three and a black. It has Swamp Walk. And as long as it's in your graveyard and you control a swamp, creatures you control have Swamp Walk. So you are always going to have a swamp, like no matter what, like you're in black, even in a dual typing land, you're going to have it. But this card plus like an Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth where everybody has swamps basically means you have fully unblockable creatures. Um, I've I've seen this, I think the one time I saw it, it was in like a Yuriko list or something like that, just to ensure that they could like get through. But you can also run this in like big creature decks or self mill and like that type of thing. Because if you are in a black deck, there's a good chance you're also running Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth, in which case it basically just makes all of your stuff unblockable. And in the times where this card is good, it's probably disgustingly good, right? And the times where it's sort of like subpar, it's probably not that great. Coming up next uh, is one that I probably don't even have to explain as soon as you see it, and that is Cruel Entertainment. This is a seven mana, six and a black sorcery. Choose a target player and another target player. The first player controls the second player during the second player's next turn. And the second player controls the first player during the first player's next turn. Basically, you swap control of people's turns. This card is hilarious. So I have a really fun story about this. I think I had it in my Marvo video, but my fiance actually cast this card 
and she did it in a way that um, she she clashed and hit this card before a combo player's next turn, and she exchanged control of her turn and that person's turn, meaning that she could basically sabotage that person during their turn to ensure they can't combo off. And then that person took control of her turn, which basically it was like, you know, tap all my mana, let it, you know, mana burn me, not really, and then pass, right? But that turn cycle got the respect of the other two players because they went, oh my God, you just got us out of this terrible situation. And then it allowed her with her existing deck to sort of come up from behind and win the game. But without this card, she wouldn't have won. I just thought it was a really cool sort of different way because you don't think about exchanging your own turn, but that's what she did, which I think is really cool. So in most cases, you're probably going to cast this on two other people at the table. And honestly, it's more of a meme than anything else. Like this card I included it in my deck initially because I thought it was just going to be a fun sort of different card to put in there, but it's turned out to be a really dynamic and interesting card for various reasons that I never considered before, like the one swapping your turn with somebody else's and then self-sabotaging that player, or in the case where you pit other two, two other people against you, sometimes it results in scenarios where those players actually gang up against you and try to maximize to the best of their ability to come after you, which I never thought would happen. I thought, I just never crossed my mind. It's just interesting the dynamics at the table that this card sort of generates. And nobody, honestly, nobody I've ever cast this on has been salty when it's cast because it's just so bizarre that everybody is very like willing to resolve it. They're very invested in the like resolution of this spell. So give it a try. I think it's really cool. Up next, this is sort of like just an honorable mention, truthfully, um, but it's a land, but it has black in it. So makes it on the list. It's Cabal Pit. You can tap it to add black to your mana pool and then it deals one damage to you. But there's more, wait, there's more. It also has Threshold. Threshold meaning if you have seven or more cards in your graveyard, you can activate this ability. So you can pay black and then tap it, sacrifice the pit, target creature gets negative two, negative two until end of turn. That has come up so many times for me, you will not believe it. This basically replaces a swamp in most of my decks that I run black in. And you would think it wouldn't make that much of a difference, but the number of times this card has either saved my ass or you know, disrupted a combo or whatever is staggering because nobody thinks about this on the board. It's just a negative two on board. Nobody considers it a problem until it just totally screws over whoever it is that you're targeting. This card is stupid good. I love running it in every one of my black decks and I can't recommend it enough. It's just more of like a cut a single swamp, throw a cabal pit in type of situation. There's no real thought to it. You're in black, so you're likely going to be hitting the threshold anyway, unless you get your graveyard exiled, I guess. But most of the time, almost every time I've been able to hit threshold and this card has been good. So give it a try. So up next is one I actually have a physical copy of um, on hand immediately, and that's Coast Coon Falls. It's two black black for enchant world. Ooh. During your upkeep, tap target untapped creature you control or destroy Coast Coon Falls. That's not the good part. Maybe for some of you masochists, it has been not for me. And then no creature can attack you unless its controller pays an additional two on the attack. This is just black propaganda. And nobody ever sees it coming. Like you're in mono black or whatever. Like if you're in Demir, you run propaganda, right? But if you're in mono black or Golgari or something else like that that doesn't have like the standard blue white prevent combat type of stuff, this card just comes out of nowhere for a lot of people and they go, oh my God. Like, I never would have expected this to be in your deck. That's the reaction I've got every time when I've played it is, what is that? Are you telling me that Black has a propaganda now? And I'm like, now? This card was printed in like 25 years ago. It's been out for a long time. And it still puts in work today. Sure, it's one extra mana, but the utility that it offers you outside of the traditional color pie is incredible. The only problem, of course, is that you have to tap something during your upkeep. Otherwise, it just gets destroyed. But even if it buys you a turn at a later stage of the game, that's worth four mana to me. So I'd really recommend you give it a try if you're looking for something that's a bit outside of sort of the typical um, 
attributes that we give to the colors that we play in. It always sneaks up on people. It's great. So up next is one that I'm surprised I don't see in more decks. It's on, it's in a decent number of them, but way less than I would have otherwise thought. It's Carnival of Souls. It's two, or it's two mana, so one in a black for an enchantment. Whenever a creature comes into play, not under your control, just any creature comes into play, you lose one life and add black to your mana pool. This is such a me card. I'm surprised I only recently found out about it because I love the fact that you can't prevent this. Like, it's not like a May ability. It's just, you just lose a life and add a black, period. So if somebody plays Kadira Caller of the Small or whatever, name your token commander here and generates 30 of these, well, I guess I just added 30 black and lost 30 life. And if that means I died, well, I guess I died. Uh, that It is what it is, right? But this card has tons of combo potential. If you look on EDH Rec, a lot of the standard combos are with Reassembling Skeleton and a Phyrexian Altar and then pretty much anything else to drain the table, like a Zolport Cutthroat, for instance. It's just insane advantage in general. Like if you're in more of a token-heavy build already, you can sort of abuse this to go off the turn that you play it, which I sort of see as the main purpose and utility for this card is to sort of use it in that way, not so much a run this out, see what happens, because people are then going to just play tons of creatures and your life total is going to dwindle fast, but more so play this at a stage where you think, I'm going to try to lock up the game here. If I can't lock it up, I have another plan. Maybe I have some Phyrexian on life effect, or maybe I have a way to just destroy it so this card can't persist on the board when I don't need it anymore, something like that. But I think when you play this card, you're probably trying to win the game most likely at that stage. So give this card a look. It's a little bit more expensive, but I think that it's just crazy what it does for you. So it's probably worth the cost. All right, we're on to some crazy stuff now. So we're talking about Endless Whispers, two black black for an enchantment. And it has each creature has, when this creature is put into the graveyard from play, choose target opponent. That player puts this creature card from that graveyard into play under his or her control at the end of turn. Wow. So the low hanging fruit here is obviously Phage the Untouchable. So if you're able to give somebody Phage and you just basically kill them, that's hilarious. But the other way that you can sort of use this is more so in like a control heavy style deck. Or if you just like pandemonium, like if you just like crazy crap happening all the time because, oh, if your creatures got wiped, trigger, 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 trigger on this, everybody gets everybody else's thing. That's pretty funny too. I mean, keep in mind it triggers for your stuff, meaning that you have to choose an opponent to get one of your creatures, but it also makes crazy board states. And I think really, like I said, if you're looking for more of like a pandemonium crazy game, you might want to consider including this card if that's what you're looking for. So up next is a card that um, this one actually does show up in more lists, but I feel like I have to highlight it because I personally haven't seen it a lot. And I think it's one of those cards where maybe sort of like the older guard of players has used it more so than people who are newer in the game. And I just want to highlight it. So it's two mana, one in a black for Heartless Summoning. It's an enchantment. Creature spells you cast cost two less. But there's a drawback. Creatures you control get negative one, negative one statically. Listen, I don't care about the negative one, negative one, right? You can stack that onto my creatures all day, every day. Two mana to cost reduce every creature you cast is just insane. And if you're in, I know, I, I know I'm saying reanimator a lot, but like if you're in something like a reanimator build where you can get out things much cheaper at a much earlier stage, or you know, use this to pay for your commander tax or whatever. I don't care that it gives me negative one, negative one. That doesn't matter to me. I'm still going to run you over or I'm still going to combo you out because this is such a crazy cost reduction. It's basically like an Urza's incubator, but it's like even a little bit better in a lot of ways because it's every single creature you cast, not just one specific tribe. So give this card a look. I think it's actually pretty busted, especially in the right creature heavy list. Up next is a card that actually has only been printed one time, I think, and that's Force of Despair. So three black black for an instant. If it is not your turn, you may exile a black card from your hand rather than pay the spell's mana cost. Already very attractive. Destroy all creatures that enter the battlefield this turn. Man, if I had this card in tons of different situations, I would have been so happy. 
even if this card acts just as like a one for one to eliminate key pieces, it's good for me. The thing that makes this card, I think, sort of extra good is the fact that it is not selecting the creature. It's just acting as sort of a board wipe because Ward and also Hexproof and Shroud are on so many cards nowadays. And so many people run the Swiftfoot Boots, Lightning Greaves type of thing nowadays that cards like this that can sort of get around those cards without much hesitation, I think are really, really good. And I've been putting more and more priority on things that say like, just symmetrically destroy things or players sacrifice something, that type of text. And this card is right in line with that. I think it's actually really great, especially because you also get the free cost by just exiling a black card anyway. So I'd give this card a look, especially as the meta is developing. Up next is a card that I actually haven't found a place for yet, but you guarantee that I'm going to be finding one. It is Head Games. It's a five mana sorcery, so three black black. Target opponent puts the cards from his or her hand on top of his or her library, then search that player's library for that many cards. So if I put seven on top, I search their library for seven new cards. It doesn't specify which ones. It can be any. The player then puts those cards into his or her hand, then shuffles his or her library. Now, this card is really interesting to me personally because I'm definitely like a political player. I like to talk people up at the table and that sort of thing. This card is almost like, let me tutor you to exactly what you need, right? To get us out of the situation, mind you. I, it's not strictly speaking. It's not just like, a, let me help you win the game because that's pretty toxic. But if there's a problem player at the table, I can say, okay, you're coming up in next in turn order. I have nothing to deal with this, but this is going to get you exactly what you need to deal with that problem over there. We're going to make this deal. I'm going to give you something you want but I am in turn going to fill your hand with crap that is going to solve this issue. And then probably the rest is basic lands or something, but you can use it as a political piece in that sense, or you can just use it as a hose against people that are maybe combo players or that type of thing. And we all know that we need to hose the combo players. So head games, maybe that's the card for you. Insidious Dreams is our next card. It is a four mana, so three and a black instant, as an additional cost to play Insidious Dreams, discard X cards from your hand, search your library for X cards, then shuffle your library, and then put those cards on top in any order. One word, Yuriko. <laughs> this card crops up primarily in Yuriko lists for obvious reasons. I think that there's definitely a point to be made, especially about maybe self-mill or things that care about things being on top, like Marvo, for instance. It could be good there, too. It also sets up wins with Thoracle or Bolas's Citadel being able to get whatever you want on top of your library, for instance. The risk here is that the additional cost to cast is actually discarding those cards. So if this card gets countered, you just kind of get blown out. And that really is the issue. That's probably why a lot of people don't run this card. But I think in casual formats, this card can genuinely be really good, especially if you're stacking triggers. Like you have a Yuriko trigger and then you add to this, right? You add on to the stack on top of that trigger. Let this resolve. You get whatever you want on top multiple times. And then Yuriko just gets to dome people for a ton of damage. So really good card in the right circumstance. Probably not the best in a high-powered list, but maybe we could see it sort of making a come up there. But otherwise, you know, I think it's just generally speaking, probably a good card. So give it a look. So one of the most expensive cards I have on the list is the next one. Uh, it's just, I love the art. I'm going to throw it up on screen now. That's honestly part of the reason that I wanted to include it. But I found a deck that I think it can go in. Uh, one of my friends has this deck and I'm going to recommend it to them. It's three black pips. Black, black, black for Season of the Witch. It's an enchantment. At the end of each player's turn, all of his or her untapped creatures that could have attacked but did not are destroyed. If you do not pay two life during your upkeep, Season of the Witch is destroyed, and then you can't redirect or prevent this damage, essentially. Um, so the commander I'm thinking about is Sig River Cutthroat, because Sig cares about every turn cycle, your opponent's losing life effectively. And if you have a way in SIG, I don't know, maybe propaganda, you know, something like that to prevent people from attacking you with those creatures, they will continuously attack each other with something like Season of the Witch Out, effectively allowing you, 
the SIG player to draw more cards on other people's turns, which is just great. It's an, a beautiful cycle, I guess you can call it. And it's just really fun to me that like this card that was printed, what is this, The Dark, I think? It's from The Dark set or whatever it's called. Many, many years ago was a black card prioritizing forced combat. Like what was the utility or thought process behind making this card? It seems very out of its color pie. And I just love it. I love the art. I love this card. Give it a try. Now, I'll be honest. This next one is really a pitch for you, the audience. Uh, it's a five mana enchantment called Worms of the Earth. Two and then three black pips. Oh, boy. No lands may be brought into play. <laughs> During any player's upkeep, any player may destroy Worms of the Earth by sacrificing two lands or taking five damage from this card. Look, it's bad. I get it. I understand how you all feel about this. But this is a challenge for you, the community, because Anson Maddox, I love his work, and he does all this very like crazy, disgusting artwork. Just look at it. Like It's terrible. It's terrifying, honestly. And this card is only showing up in 130 decks on EDH Rec. It does seem bad, but I think that we need to find a way to abuse or break this card just on the basis of the art being like, ugh. By the way, Anson Maddox, if you ever want to come on the, you know, the channel, you're more than welcome to. I'd love to discuss art with you. That would be fabulous. Two and a black for a sorcery. Pain's reward is our next card. You bid any amount of life. <laughs> In turn order, each player may top the high bid. The bidding ends if the high bid stands. The high bidder then loses life equal to the high bid and then draws four cards. I just love symmetrical effects. I'll be honest. That's really why it's in here. I love any of like the old cards that say like bid. It, uh, there's the red card with the elephant on the pedestal where you have to like bid to. Anything where like we're sort of bidding life to get this effect, it just makes me giddy. I just love the idea of all my friends looking at their life total, looking at their hand and going, oh man, I could really use four more cards. I guess I bid 18 life because I really want to win this game, right? that type of thing and then letting it like roll through and then letting them either win or deal with their repercussions seems hilarious to me. Now, obviously this might be better in a situation where, you know, you're in like a life gain situation, you're like in an Orzov cleric or life gain style deck and you have a ton of life to play with so you can outbid everybody else at the table or get to the point where you bid a lot. Somebody thinks they're going to stick it on you because you really want the cards and then you let them lose a bunch of life. It seems like there's a lot of fun ways to sort of play this card out. So it's on the list for that reason. It's Payne's Reward, three mana for a sorcery. All right. We're talking about misinformation today. And no, I'm not talking about the Trump campaign. I'm talking about the one mana black instant. Put up to three target cards from an opponent's graveyard on top of his or her library in any order. So this card is interesting for a number of reasons. First off, it's in a single black pip, right? So it's sort of easy to cast. It's easy to hold up for. So it's flexible in that capacity. You can hose people that are tutoring. So if somebody does like a mystical tutor at somebody's end step before, you know, it gets back to their turn or whatever, or before like maybe their draw step and their upkeep, they cast it and then they're going to draw it, you go, oh, well, I guess I just take that Mystical Tutor or whatever it is and just put it right back on top for you. Or if you have other cards like lands, like a Terramorphic Expanse or something, I just get to basically hide the card you tutored for on top. So not only does it have that flexibility, but it also synergizes with anything that steals from your opponent's decks. So one of the primary commanders that I think of is Trotta, but also Lobelia, Sackville Baggins is also another card that cares about what's on top of your you know, opponent's libraries. So I think that there's a lot of ways that you could sort of spin this card to be generally good in a list. Unfortunately, it does have to be an opponent. So effects like Sir Conrad that would care about something like this, unfortunately don't work because it can only be on your opponents. But I think that the utility in certain commander decks like Atrada or Lobelia to either... Um, interact with your opponents in a unique way by getting rid of the tutored card by hiding it underneath three fresh ones that you put up there or just gaining value off of your commander with this card is unique enough for me to include it in this list and I think it's worth a look. Next, we're gonna talk about Calculating Lich. This is a six mana, so four black black for a zombie wizard, five five. It has menace and then whenever a creature attacks one of your opponents, that player loses one life. 
So <laughs> this is symmetrical, by the way, meaning that your opponents also get this. So if you're playing against another token deck, more the merrier, I guess, right? You can use this in a go wide strat, zombie tribal. You can use this in a gold mechanic deck, maybe something like, oh, I don't know, um, anything that has red in it, I guess. Or you can also use this to punish tokens, right? You can play this sort of as a quasi punish for people that are going to be attacking because it is on attack that this is resolving. So your opponents now have to be more selective about who and where they're going to be swinging those tokens. It's one of those cards that is actually genuinely quite versatile. I've seen this used in games. I think I watched a loading ready run episode where this card was used and it was used to very good effect. In fact, people were prioritizing removing it because it was just a bit too good at the table at the time. And I think that it's probably just mostly slept on because it's generally not in a lot of decks. And I can see why it's six mana for this effect. But the fact that it's a symmetrical one where you can sort of have more versatility in your pods with it, and probably you're going to be playing it in a token strategy of your own, I think makes it worthwhile to include on this list. So a card that I actually have been using and I've been very happy with is Torgar Famine Incarnate. It is eight mana, six black black. It's kind of a lot. It's a seven, six avatar. It's a legendary creature, by the way. As an additional cost to cast the spell, you may sack any number of creatures and this spell costs two less to cast for each of those sacrifice creatures. Pretty hot, but it gets better. When Torgar Famine Incarnate enters the battlefield, ETB by the way, up to one target player's life total becomes half their starting life total rounded down. So it becomes 20, effectively. And this card, why, why did I include this in here? So not only, how should I say this? Not only does it take advantage of you making excessive tokens in a black format, which there's a lot of commanders that do that, Aristocrats cares about this, etc., especially aristocrats because you just get the free sack on this which is great but in addition to that it also helps end games faster you're going to be having people's life totals at a sooner point in the game and if you draw this at a later stage in the game it can also be recovery for you because it's any target player's life total becomes half it doesn't say you have their life total it says it becomes half of their starting life total meaning that you can also use it to heal yourself I've used this in my Marvo deck and it's just been great like every time. I mean, it's a big beater. You can play for relatively cheap. You get to have the flexibility of ripping down your opponent's life totals really quickly or in the event of, you know, you're in dire straits, you can use it on yourself and regain life. It's been very flexible and I think it's definitely worth a look if you haven't already tried it. Look, I get why people don't play this next one, but cut me a break. We're kind of in like the jank territory here and that's Bog Witch. So it's three mana, two and a black for a human spell shaper. You pay black and then tap this card and discard a card by the way, and then add three black to your mana pool. Yes, there are some other cards that are better out there, but typically they're for specific tribes, for instance, that do this type of effect. Uh, with the recent release of Modern Horizons 3, we're also getting some cards that outclass this a little bit. But if you're looking for a very budgetary format, something to help set up your graveyard and also ramp you, this card kind of does it all. I mean, it's not the greatest. I'm not saying that it's going to replace certain auto includes for you and your decks, but if you're building on a budget and you want something that maybe not everybody sees at the table, this is going to fit that bill for you. So Elder Brain, everybody knows it. I'm a simp for this card, especially this art right here. I love it. Seven mana and you get a horror, 6-6 six, six horror with menace. I'm going to be quick. I promise guys we will be past it. Whenever it attacks a player, exile all cards from that player's hand. Then they draw that many. You may play lands and cast spells from among the exiled cards for as long as they remain exiled. And if you cast a spell this way, you may spend mana as though or mana of any color to cast those spells. This card has always been one of my fan favorites. The art is great. The effect is always great. Everybody's always scared of this card at the table. It deflects hate away from your commander. And recently I've been including this in one of my budget lists, my Ishin list with double combat triggers. Guess what? It's an attack trigger, meaning you get to do the thing twice. <laughs> you basically just get like 14 free cards off of this if you're able to get an attack out while you have Ishin. It's great. I love this card. So I can't recommend enough. I'm not going to chew your ear off about it just because I feel like I've recommended it enough already. 
So let's move on to the next one. So up next is word of command. It is two black pips for an instant. And I'm gonna read you the original text on this because it can be a little bit confusing and then we're gonna go over what it can and cannot do. So you get to, so instant speed, look at target opponent's hand and choose a card from it. You control that player until word of command finishes resolving. The player plays that card if able. While doing so, the player can activate mana abilities only if they're from lands he or she controls and only if mana they produce is spent to activate other mana abilities of lands he or she controls and or play that selected card. If the chosen card is to cast a spell, you control that player while the spell is resolving. Okay, this is kind of confusing. So let's talk about the things you can do. So you can view any information that they have access to, including their sideboard, if you were to cast this card. Now in Commander, we don't really play a sideboard, so you can avoid that part. You um, Also with this card, you can and you must cast and play a selected card if possible. You must. If there is something you can do, you must do it at that time. You can also make any decisions for the spell um, as it is cast and resolved. So if there's multiple modes or that type of thing, you get to decide that as the person controlling that player as this resolves. And if the selected card is something like a shock land, let's say, you get to elect if that shock land comes in tapped or untapped, meaning you can shock the person that you're controlling for that two life. So this card is really weird. It's janky. Uh, you're probably never going to see it again. This card is actually very expensive. Uh, the only reason I put it on here is because it is such a niche include. Like if you cast this on somebody, it's just very like, it, it's very crazy. It's one of the only cards where this card has to be resolving and you add something else on top of it. Like if I cast another spell, for instance, out of that opponent's hand. So it's very uh, interesting and unique in that capacity. So I would give it a look if you're interested in something a bit more bizarre, but I would not encourage you to run out and buy this card because it's not some crazy powerhouse necessarily, despite what the price might recommend online. But I thought you would find it interesting at showing up at number 29 on this list. And number at number 30, we have Protection Racket, which is a three mana black enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, repeat the following process for each opponent in turn order, by the way. Reveal the top card of your library. That player may pay life equal to the mana value if they do exile it. Otherwise, put it into your hand. Now, importantly, this does not draw you anything, but it does actually lead to strict card advantage for you, which I believe in this case is the important part. I've used this various times and I've been very happy with the outcome every time I've used it. I can't believe this happened, but like I literally ran out of like space on my video card with just like, this final segment remaining. So yeah, Protection Racket is really good and you should probably run it in your decks. Moving on. And there are probably a ton of other black cards that I am actually missing from this list, but that's fine. This is just meant to be just sort of like a touchstone video to sort of get your curiosity sparked. And if you made it to the end of it, I really appreciate you sticking around. Make sure that you share it with somebody who you think is going to benefit from it and or try out the cards for yourself and let me know how they do for you. I also just want to take this moment to shout out my patrons on my Patreon. Their names are going to be up on screen right now. They are part of the reason that I'm able to do this. And if you're interested in seeing the continuation of the channel, I would really encourage you to go over to my Patreon. I'm now doing releases for when I make decks. I'm sort of doing a pre-release, so to speak, putting it out with my ideas about the deck, what's worked, what hasn't worked, all that sort of stuff. And you get that well in advance to the video coming out. So if it's something that interests you, go over to the Patreon and take a look over there. As always, thank you very much for giving me your time today to watch this video. I know it was kind of a long one, but I really appreciate you sticking around. And I've been Kyle. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.